Cool, yeah, I think we can get started uh, whenever, if that sounds good. So, Sergey, do you want to start the intro and want me to start it? Sure, I, I could say a few words. Um, yeah, so uh, Greg is, uh, well, first of all, it's, a, it's an enormous uh, pleasure to introduce Greg for his uh, thesis. Uh, I guess we're not allowed to call it a thesis, but for his thesis talk. Uh, so he doesn't, there's no adversarial element to it, although we can make it adversarial with some tough questions. Uh, Greg has been uh, actually at Berkeley for quite a while. He was an undergraduate here uh, where, when he worked with uh, Peter Abiel, and then he's been a graduate student with Peter and myself. Uh, I think one of the things that really stands out to me about uh, Greg's thesis work is that uh, perhaps much more so than most other people I know, Greg is really, like, is really driven by making things actually work. Sometimes in research, we, we neglect this important detail. Uh, and ho hopefully, you know, you'll all be convinced by his talk that some of the stuff that he's been working on over the past five years kind of really and truly do work, uh, which is uh, not to be taken for granted. That's not, that's not a very common thing in research. So uh, Greg's thesis work is on uh, learning-based uh, navigation for mobile robots. And, uh, and you know, it's probably, probably fair to say that over the past five years, uh, Greg has basically taken this area from the, the world of uh, SLAM and model-based navigation, which is actually something he worked on briefly in, in undergrad, to uh, systems that are pretty much entirely learned uh, and, and, and much simpler than the kind of systems that existed before. Uh, and, you know, systems that you can actually take on a real robot outside, on Berkeley sidewalks even, and actually get them to do something sensible, which is pretty amazing. Like, um, you know, when, uh, when I teach 188, and I think, Peter, you have this slide in your 188 lectures too, early on we have a lecture where we talk about like the things that AI can do now and the things they can't. And I vividly remember one of the things that's listed as like the thing that AI can't do is like uh, drive, like the, the one that it can do is like drive a car on a highway. The one it can't do is drive a car down Telegraph Avenue. Uh, and when I saw uh, some of Greg's more recent results, which he'll hopefully share with us in this talk, it kind of evoked feelings of that. It's like, wow, this is the kind of stuff that a few years back we would have said AI definitely can't do. Um, so I think Greg's accomplished some pretty incredible things in his thesis, and uh, I really look forward to this talk. Uh, Peter, do you want to say a few words? Sure. I think, you know, Sergey summarized it really well with Greg. This has been in his PhD, and I think Greg is quite unique in terms of coverage on real robots, driving and flying and manipulation. Um, it's hard enough to get one type of robot to do anything, uh, when, especially, you know, real robots, not in simulation, always very hard. And Greg managed to do that on, not, and not only manipulation robots, even surgical manipulation robots during his undergrad, which um, to me, the first time I met Greg was when he was an undergrad researcher or wanted to be an undergrad researcher. And we had him work on some surgical robot project. Then those robots were, Greg, I think, breaking every day more than once, um, something yeah. like that. And nevertheless, Greg got those robots to work. And I was, I was like, okay, well, whatever we send Greg's way, he's going to make it work. And I think he's, he's definitely shown that through his PhD. Um, it's uh, pretty amazing. And much looking forward to your talk, Greg. Awesome. Yeah, thank you. Thank you for the awesome introductions. Um, so yeah, let me uh, just get set up and, and we'll kind of jump straight into it. Okay. So yeah, so yeah, th thanks everyone for, for coming. Um, so yeah, today I'll be talking about kind of yeah stuff that I've done over the past five years. Um, and basically, yeah, what I've been working on is mobile robot learning. Um, yeah, let's just jump right into it after I fix one thing. Cool. Okay. So here we go. So yeah, why do we want autonomous robots? Well, I, th I think there, there's a few reasons, but I kind of largely group them into two categories. Uh, the first I'll say is to do things we don't want to do. Uh, for example, uh, we don't want to, you know, drive in traffic or, you know, go down into mines, which are dangerous. Uh, and another category I'd say is to do things we want, but we can't get. Uh, maybe we want, you know, groceries, but we're not physically capable of getting them. 
or you know, we want packages delivered from across the world that we wouldn't otherwise have access to. But I guess uh, one question is, why don't we have autonomous robots? Well, I guess on one hand, we have some. Uh, most people know what a Roomba is. Um, but in general, there aren't actually much robots beyond that. Um, and, and I would say the predominant issues are, I would say, two things. So first, I would say is environment variability. So that you know, robots work OK when things are kind of you know, monotonous and very much the same. But as soon as things change a lot, they tend to be brittle and break. Uh, and, and the other one is user expectations. Um, we as human users, whether it's due to, you know, media or whatnot, we expect robots, you know, when they're supposed to do X, they're supposed to do it successfully all the time. And, and I think this is exacerbated a lot uh, for mobile robots. Um, you know, when you have a robot, let's say an autonomous car driving, driving around, um, you know, there's a lot of weird things that can happen on the road that you wouldn't expect. And also for mobile robots, things like safety, like we really do expect our autonomous cars to not crash. So we have a very you know, high threshold on what we consider uh, okay. So I, I think one scenario kind of epitomizing what I think mobile robot learning would hopefully solve would be driving the scenario like this. Um, I saw this from, from Drew Bagnell's talk from a few years ago. And I mean, obviously this, is, this seems hard for many of us for just to drive you know, drive ourselves, let alone, you know, a robot, you know, being able to navigate with all these different cars and people and kind of implicit, uh, you know, social norms and things like that. And I think this scenario is actually precisely what excites me about uh, mobile robot learning. Like, to me, it seems almost impossible to hard code, you know, what a robot should do. To me, it seems like you really need a data driven approach in order to have robots successfully navigate. So I guess, yeah, what's, what's my goal for mobile robot learning? I think this is kind of my, my cartoon depiction is to be able to, you know, me, I take my robots, I just throw them out into the environment, basically literally throw them. And if I can just, you know, kick back, relax and have them, you know, learn what to do. Like that's, that's kind of what my dream has been. Like my dream meaning like if I could solve this, I would just, you know, retire and, and call it a day. So yeah, in my work uh, over the past five years, I've been trying to you know, chip away at uh, a lot of the issues um, that need to be overcome in order to, to reach this dream. And in this talk, I'll talk about kind of three challenges um, th that I've been trying to address. Uh, the first is sample efficiency, the second is supervision, and the third is safety. And to keep us organized, I have this little uh, chart at the bottom, which will highlight where we're at. So if you zone out, go to the bathroom or anything, uh, that, that's your guiding light. And, and at the end, I'm also going to talk about some kind of more informal things I've learned in my PhD and, and acknowledge all the people that have uh, uh, supported me on this, on this journey. OK, uh, sample efficiency. So uh, first, what is sample efficiency? Well, basically, the problem is trying to address is that gathering robot data is a pain. So here, we have two robots that I've worked with, an RC car and a little quad rotor. And just basically everything that can go wrong will go wrong. And it's just a huge laborious task. So uh, a lot of the methods in reinforcement learning, so you know, how reinforcement learning being you know, how to learn control policies uh, in this context for robots, uh, a lot of them use a lot of data. Um, so for example, if you look at this x-axis here, that's hundreds of millions of frames. So th that's, that's a ton of data. Y-axis on both of these is, is performance. And also, they require a lot of tuning. So here, um, it's the same algorithm, but different hyperparameters. So the red, orange, and blue, they change the neural network structure. And you can see that you know, that has a large effect on the performance of the algorithm. So that takes a lot of data, a lot, of, um, especially to tune. And also, these algorithms uh, are what we call on policy, meaning that they can't reuse old data. So if you run an experiment that takes 200 million uh, you know, data points, and you know, if something goes wrong, you got to run it again. You got to throw out all that old data, um, which is just really hard to do for any real robot applications. Now, model-based RL, on the other hand, um, kind of the gist behind that is it tries to learn kind of how does the world work, and this has been shown to have a lot of awesome benefits. Uh, here's an example of um, some work that learned to swing a car pull up in only 18 seconds. And here's some more recent work that actually learned uh, models for images and used that for manipulation. And kind of the main um, uh, things that people who, who support model-based say is that it generally takes less data. 
um, less tuning because it reduces the supervised learning. And it's off policy, meaning that you can use any data. You don't have to throw out old data. So I, I've thrown, I guess, the, the two ideas that I've talked about, model-based methods and model-free, and kind of the pros and cons. And I, I think it's probably very obvious that for every green, there's a red. And for every green on this side, there's a red on this side. So they seem, I guess, very complementary. And there's been a lot of work that's tried to, uh, that, that's combined these. But I'd say most of this work kind of combines them in a, you know, run A and use that to initialize B. Um, and what we were trying to look in this work is, can we actually come up with a, a unified framework that interpolates between the two in kind of a, a clean uh, fashion? And this led to our work, which we called uh, Generalized Computation Graphs, or GCG. Okay, so before I explain kind of what GCG is, let's start at the extremes, and then hopefully that'll make understanding the interpolation a little bit easier. So on the model-based side, what is model-based RL? Well, you learn a model that takes as input the current state, such as, let's say, the current robot image, the current action, let's say, you know, the steering, and it predicts, you know, where is the robot going to go next? And we train this using the ground truth uh, data from the robot actually running. So that's on the model-based side. Um, and on the model-free side, um, actually, before, before I head over, one thing to know is that you generally roll this out into the future. So you think, let's say, a few seconds ahead. So this model is kind of recursive. Now, on the other hand, we have model-free. So what does model-free do? Well, it takes as input the current state and the current action, and it predicts how well is the robot going to do at this time step, so what's the reward, and then what's the, oh, it's the sum of all future rewards. And then you compare this kind of with the ground truth, and that's how you train your model. Um, you shouldn't be able to understand model based and model free from this. Um, there's a lot more details, but hopefully uh, this gives you the gist. This learns how to model, and this learns kind of what is good and what is bad. So, what is UCG? Well, let's actually show what the graph is. So, it takes as input the state and an action, and actually a sequence of actions. So, kind of like model based. And it predicts a series of uh, predictions, these y hats, and at the end, a terminal value b hat. You somehow combine all of these, compare them to the ground truth values, and you have a loss that's used to train the model. Now, this is extremely uh, kind of vague, but let's see how this GCG can actually get us the extremes of model based and model free. And the way uh, we, we are able to do that is by two mechanisms uh, the horizon and the bootstrap. So the horizon is how far into the future are we explicitly predicting? So let's say we have a big horizon, basically let's say to infinity. We want to predict what happens when I drive forever. Um, then you're basically in purely model-based land because you're just learning a model of how the world proceeds. Uh, on the other hand, let's say you make the horizon one. So you just have the one action and you just predict y hat and this uh, bootstrap value to go term. Then you're more in model free land. So you're just kind of directly learning what actions are good and bad. But now what GCG lets you is it lets you interpolate between the two kind of by deciding the horizon and deciding if you have this bootstrap or not. And so this is, this is one nice thing about GCG. And there's also some other things that uh, knobs that lets you to. So the first is what is the model? Um, you know, is it a neural net, Gaussian process, something else? Uh, another is what do you actually predict as output? It could be maybe reward or it's something I'll talk about soon, collision. Um, and lastly, what is the loss function? Um, are you doing classification regression? Something like that. And I think the value of GCG comes from all these decisions. Um, they really let you tailor the algorithm to what you're trying to solve in order to get the best performance possible. So now let's look at um, a specific instantiation. This is all abstract. Let's kind of ground it in an actual problem that we want to solve. So the problem that we wanted to solve in this project was to get this RC car right here to be able to uh, drive around and avoid collisions. So the RC car has sensors, it has a camera um, to see the world and uh, be, to be able to avoid collisions. Uh, it has an IMU, uh, this detects acceleration, uh, linear accelerations, angular velocities. So basically, you know, did I crash or not? And it has a wheel encoder, which says how fast are the wheels going. Uh, it also has the actions are, you know, the steering and the motor and it has an onboard computer to run everything. And yeah, so we wanted to learn to navigate and in some you know, challenging scenarios, uh, for example, you know, the lighting conditions here are kind of weird and varying. And here we have this transparent wall, which can be uh, 
typically challenging for standard approaches to navigation. OK, so I'm going to skip a little bit of the details of how we found this instantiation of GCG, because um, that's a bit going to take too much time. But what I'll say is that, you know, first, what we found worked best was we had a, we used a neural network for the model. This is because we had uh, our observations were images, so very high dimensional, so neural networks can scale to that. The second thing is, what did the model actually predict? Uh, we had to predict um, collision, um, basically, because the task was collision avoidance. So it kind of seems like the most obvious thing is to just directly predict what you care about. And because we were doing collision, this is kind of binary, yes or no, we were able to do a classification loss, which made, uh, uh, which made performance much better. And then perhaps the most important thing is, you know, what was the horizon and what was the bootstrap? How model-based or how model-free were we? And we found that being more model-based, so having a relatively short horizon, so horizon 12, this corresponds to predicting about three seconds into the future, and we had no bootstrap. So this basically means the robot only thought about the current three seconds. And while this is greedy, this worked well for our, our task, which was, again, collision avoidance. OK, and here's actually the GCG model. This is the neural network. So it takes as input the past four uh, grayscale images, passes them through some convolutional layers. We have an LSTM, a recurrent neural network, that takes as input each action. So this is going to be the steering and the motor. And at each time step, it's going to predict uh, whether the robot is going to collide or not. OK, so that's the model. But we actually need you know, kind of the, the, the reinforcement learning framework to actually train it. So we're going to have training time and inference time. So at training time, uh, we have all this data. So again, this is our grayscale images, uh, the actions we're thinking about, and whether we collide it or not. And we're going to be using this to train our GCG model uh, via that loss. Then we're going to have the robot run. So the robot gets the current state. So that's going to be you know, the, the onboard uh, image. It's going to find the best action sequence to achieve what it wants. So what it wants to do is avoid collisions. So it's going to say, hey, I'm going to think about all these different action sequences and predict what happens. So this one turns out it led to collision, so that's bad. This one is good. This one lets no collision. So it's going to select, OK, these are the actions I'm going to want to do. It's going to execute the first action and repeat. And while this is going on, it's going to be sending data uh, to the training uh, station so that the uh, model can continuously get updated. And then as the model's training, it's going to push the most recent uh, model parameters so that the, uh, the model can get better and better as the robot navigates. All right, cool. So first, we, uh, we evaluate our uh, results in, uh, in simulation. And here's an, an example of our robot driving around. I, I won't let it fully run, but it's able to, to do multiple laps around this little track. And kind of the main thing we were trying to show in simulation is how does this compare to you know, kind of off-the-shelf methods? And the main one we compared to was, was variance of cue learning. And, and the main thing you can see is uh, x-axis is time, so how long, did, how much data, and y-axis is performance, uh, how far did it travel. And as you can see, our method in green, um, it's very, it, it goes up faster, which is good, so it learns with less data, and it's also much more stable. But if you look at kind of the other methods, you know, some of them go up fast, but they're a bit unstable, or some of them are very slow. So we think that this kind of showed well that we were able to tune the algorithm to the task in order to get the performance that we wanted. And perhaps most importantly, yeah, we, we ran this on a real robot. So uh, here we have you know, our RC car. And uh, what we did is we let it drive around for four hours, um, you know, just kind of crashing, backing up, and keep going. And it was able to learn to avoid collisions purely from uh, this, uh, yeah, from this data. There was no pre-training on any data, just the four hours. And it was able to deal with kind of the different lighting conditions, the transparent walls. And here you can see it's uploading the data so that training continue, can continue offline as it keeps going. So again, for the sake of time, I'm, I'm, I'm going to skip it. It is able to make the loop. Um, and we also compared it to some other methods as well. The random policy is just to show you have to turn. We also ran Q-learning. And in Q-learning, it made some progress, but it just wasn't really able to, to fully leverage the four hours, uh, unlike our method. OK, so yeah, so some takeaways um, is uh, hopefully I, I've uh, hammered this in during this part is, yeah, to really tailor the algorithm uh, to the task. Um, well, I, I think it's nice to say, you know, hey, we have this black box reinforcement learning algorithm that we can throw at anything and it works. 
um, I, I think in practicality, one, that, that's not generally what happens. And two, when something does break, you know, if you don't have any knobs to try to make it better, you're, you're almost at a loss. Uh, you kind of have to go back to square one. So GCG kind of gives you some knobs in, in order to, to help the designer of the algorithm. Um, another takeaway for me is that, yeah, you don't have to choose between these two camps of thinking, model-based and model-free. Like, to me, it's, it's almost arbitrary at this point. Like, really, it's on a spectrum, and, and we should treat it as such. And uh, lastly, uh, this one's a bit nuanced, but, but that bootstrapping term, so uh, kind of the model free, is that it was really hard for me to try to get it to work with this off-policy data. Um, and and this, this work is from about 2017, and there's been a lot of work since then trying to improve that, but, but I think this is still a really important challenge um, that hopefully people will make progress on. Okay, so yeah, that, that's it for sample efficiency. So now I'm going to move on to supervision. So for supervision, kind of the question that we're, we're getting at is how do we tell the robot what we want it to do? For example, um, let's say on the, on the left, I want my robot to avoid collisions. But now it's in this, this tall grass. Uh, you know, does that, is it going to collide if it drives into it? Well, I mean, there is geometry there, but maybe it can just plow right over it. It, it's, it's a bit unclear. Uh, another scenario on the right is let's say we want a robot to, to drive on smooth terrain. Let's say it's carrying you know, some drinks and it doesn't want to spill them. How do we actually tell it you know, that the concrete path is probably smoother than this bumpy grass? Um, you know, the robot only sees this as a bunch of pixels. These are just some numbers. Um, so while this might seem trivial to us, uh, it can be actually very hard for robots to understand. And there's been a lot of work on trying to address this and kind of, you know, the first solution which people generally go to is, you know, how can I hand engineer a control policy to solve these? Um, but yeah, in general, you can get kind of weird behavior. Uh, for example, this robot, um, it's running a LiDAR policy. So this LiDAR detects any obstacle in front of it. And it was, you know, the policy said, okay, don't go towards anything that's close to me. Well, now it thinks it can't drive on grass, which is kind of a failure. And uh, another one, again, is, is this bumpy terrain. Um, there's kind of, it's kind of hard just to say, you know, that's bumpy terrain and that's not uh, just from a human hand engineered standpoint. So uh, another way to go about this is to provide some sort of uh, human supervision. Um, so I'll, I'll cover these with this uh, informal graph where the x-axis is how much human effort does it take and the y-axis is how informative is that supervision signal. So on one hand, you could just say, okay, um, the task success. So you, the robot does something, and then you give a thumbs up or a thumbs down at the very end, um, and that's all the robot has to learn from. Uh, a little bit more informative is something like preferences, where you show a human, you know, what's better, this or this? And then the robot's able to kind of slowly get its way to be better and better. Uh, even more uh, effort and also more informative is providing demonstrations. So let's say I want a robot to be able to you know, manipulate cups. I might provide this video of me pushing the cup and then the robot will have learned from me pushing it how to push it itself. And then maybe on the, the most extreme uh, form of supervision is that you literally put your hands on the robot and you tell it what to do. So you, you, know, you physically show it how to tie a knot. And I think kind of one of the main challenges with, with all these approaches is that the human effort is, uh, this is, I guess, CS lingo, big O of data. Um, so all this means is that if you want more data, you have to exert more effort. Um, and, and this kind of sucks because we, the, the approaches we use require a lot of data. So we want to be able to use as much data as possible, but if there's this big cost, then it's kind of a severe limitation on us and what our robots can actually do. So what we investigated in this work was, can the robot actually provide its own form of self-supervision? Now, this is a bit of a loaded term, but, but I'll get into it uh, in a bit. So this led to our work, which we call Badger, the Berkeley Autonomous Driving Ground Robot. And it's basically able to navigate these uh, challenging scenarios I showed before, from before, the navigating the tall grass and avoiding the bumpy terrain, uh, because it learns from experience. So kind of as a quick one sentence, what Badger does is it's an end-to-end -end learning framework that uh, is self-supervised and it learns from off-policy data and it's trained fully in the real world, there's no simulation and there's no direct human supervision. So how does Badger actually work? So first, the robot Badger by itself goes and gathers a lot of data. 
And it doesn't have to be like good data. Like this is just a random control policy. So it's just kind of randomly driving around. And if something bad happens, like it notices it crashes, it just backs up and keeps going. So we had the robot do this for a long time. It was actually 40 hours, which is about 70 miles. And using that, we save all the sensor data. So the images and the IMU and also the controls. So in this case, the angular velocity and the linear velocity. And we have this big data set and what we have the robot do by itself is it goes through and it self-supervises signals that it cares about. So in this case, what we cared about is uh, the collision signal and also this bumpiness signal. So what do I mean by self-supervision? So what I mean by that is that I actually did provide some supervision. I basically wrote a little code snippet that looked at the sensors and determined if it was going to collide or be on bumpy terrain. Uh, the collision was you know, from the IMU if it detected a large jerk. And bumpy was similar. If there was a lot of angular velocity, like a lot of rolling, then it knew it was on bumpy terrain. But I guess we're calling this self-supervised because I wrote this function once, but it went through the entire data set and labeled it. And if we gather more data, I don't actually need to exert more effort. It, it's already done. So we have this nice scaling property. So how, do, how does uh, Badger work? Well, this should look actually very familiar from the, from the GCG work is that we have this neural network that takes as input the current image in a sequence of future actions, and it predicts these uh, future events, such as if you collide or if you're driving on bumpy terrain. And then what we do is at test time, uh, the, we can use this model for planning. So here I'm showing some trajectories that the robot is considering, and it's labeled with, on the left, if it thinks it's going to uh, encounter bumpy terrain, and on the right, if it thinks it's going to collide. So using this, the robot can actually then plan and execute actions that avoid bumpy terrain uh, and avoid collision. Um, but one nice thing I actually want to point out right here is that it's learned to drive on concrete, but I never told it that concrete was smooth. It just learned from itself to associate, oh, this image is correlated uh, with uh, this terrain being less bumpy. So it, it's, that's kind of the awesomeness of this uh, self-supervised mechanism. And OK, so yeah, now to some results. So here, uh, we're comparing that LiDAR policy I showed before, from before uh, with our method on the right. And as you can see, uh, like I showed before, the LiDAR policy kind of gets stuck because it falsely believes that grass is collision. While our method is driven around, it knows what kind of grass is colliding, colliding, what kind is not, and is able to reach the goal. Now, even sometimes the, the LiDAR policy, the hand engineer policy, is able to make it. Um, but it can actually do this in a suboptimal fashion. If you, if you take a look here, you see it took this kind of weird detour. Um, that's because it you know, pessimistically thought that some of the grass, again, was not traversable, while our method learned that it actually was. And we also evaluated our method in this more urban scenario, uh, which also had the goal of avoiding bumpiness. And as you can see, yeah, our method, it's able to you know, figure out, I can get to the goal while staying on this smooth uh, path, while the ladder policy basically uh, just goes directly to the goal, ignoring anything about bumpiness. OK, I'm going to skip for the sake of time. Um, and I think, think another takeaway from this self-supervised aspect is the notion of improving as it gathers more data. So here we had a scenario where our robot, we deployed it in a new environment. It had it seen, and it started driving. And lo and behold, it actually crashed. So what we did is we just let the robot run loose and drive around for about three more hours all by itself, label the data by itself, train by itself. And then it was able to actually successfully avoid uh, that obstacle and the subsequent obstacles and get to the goal. But uh, we don't always just want a robot to crash in every new place. Um, so what we showed is that given you know, a sufficient amount of data, uh, our Badger policy can generalize to new environments whether it's these open fields, this kind of uh, industrial environment, or this kind of woodsy environment at the bottom. OK, so yeah, so, some takeaways from this project. Uh, hopefully, again, I hammered uh, this in a lot, is that we really want methods that scale uh, big O of one with human effort. So we really want the human just to do the effort once, and then all additional data is just, is just awesome to get and won't cost us anything. Um, uh, another thing which maybe I didn't touch on as much is that getting the robot to fully autonomously gather this data, so that 40 hours, uh, 70 miles of data, 
was a big challenge. Like weird things happen in the real world. Like for example, I was driving the robot and I looked over and it got stuck because somehow it got stuck on its hind legs. Um, so I think this was a really kind of show the motivation of the project is that we need to move into the real world to make sure we're solving kind of the problems that we will actually encounter. Okay, so now we are going to move on to safety, uh, the, the last portion. We'll take a little pause for, for a few seconds. Okay, so yeah, diving into safety. Um, I think hopefully an elephant in the room has been this notion of safety. Um, like I just showed on the previous slide, um, you know, why is it okay for the robot to do this? Um, and on one hand, you know, this example on the left is, is kind of funny, um, but there's actually a lot more serious examples. Uh, here's an example of a Tesla driving on autopilot and it, it crashed and it failed and, and I believe it, it killed the, the driver. So this is something I think that's really important you know, for us to address if we're trying to actually deploy these navigating robots in the real world. And in reinforcement learning speak, um, kind of what I think this problem really is at its core is that there are some states that you never want to visit. Um, and I think my gut instinct when thinking about this problem was like, is this even possible? Like we're asking the robot to avoid things, um, in order because we don't want it to crash, but how can it learn about to avoid these things if it's never actually experienced them? Um, but uh, thinking on it a little bit more, I think there are some core ideas that can actually make this problem, uh, tractable. And the, the two things that I've thought of, um, are framing it in the, uh, under the terms of being conservative or leveraging an expert. So I'll talk about what I mean by this in kind of an example scenario. So let's say we are a hiker and we wanna start at this green location and our goal is to get to the red. Um, and we wanna be safe. We don't wanna get lost or get bit by a rattlesnake or make a wrong turn and die or something like that. So I'd say there's two ways. So the conservative approach would be to, okay, I generally know that trails are safer um, because they've been marked out by someone. Um, so I'll, I'll go that way. Now, maybe there is something weird, maybe there is a rattlesnake, I don't know, but I know that my odds are best if I do something like that. Uh, on the other hand, um, there's uh, the notion of an expert. So let's say I go and hire a trail guide. Um, so I could hire the trail guide and they're an expert. I'm gonna assume they know what they're doing so they can actually just plot me a direct course and I just kind of follow them and I'm along for the ride. So I think there's, the, some pros and cons from each of these approaches. Uh, I'd say the first aspect I'd say is that the conservative approach does not require any supervision. You know, you're able to follow that path by yourself. Um, while for if you need to hire an expert, like that's that's a big uh, assumption. Another one is you know which one guarantees safety. Um, so assuming that we have an expert, they're going to guarantee that, that nothing bad happens to us. Um, on the other hand, if, if we're deciding to stay on the trail and be conservative ourselves, again, something bad could happen, even if it's unlikely. And lastly, uh, there's this notion of on-policy data. So this, this is nice for the conservative approach because you actually learn better when you're the one in control. So if you're the one figuring out where to go, uh, empirically what's been shown is that, that that's a good thing. Um, meanwhile, if you're just along the ride, uh, along for the ride with the expert, um, you don't learn as well because you're not trial and error um, and figuring things out on your own. So what we were trying to figure out in this work is how can we kind of get the best of both worlds? Let's assume we have an expert. Um, how can we both guarantee safety and get this nice kind of on policy data that helps our learner uh, perform as best as possible? Okay, so we're gonna do a little bit of uh, background in order to build up to the algorithm that, that we developed and kind of the place to start for learning from experts is behavioral cloning. So all this does is you gather a bunch of expert trajectories and you train a model to imitate it. So for example, let's say we have a drone, you train an, a model that takes a simple, let's say the image and spits out the rotor velocities. So this can work well, but there is a problem that that's pretty well known and let's consider this an, an example. So let's say we have this expert trajectory right here. And let's say we start the robot at the same place right here and we run it. What happens? Well, one thing that can happen is that the learn policy just goes off in a completely different direction. And the reason why this happens is let's say the model is just slightly wrong. Then we're gonna get slightly off and now we're in a place we've never been. So we're gonna get more and more wrong. We get these compounding errors. 
And the, the fundamental issue is that the policy that we've learned reaches places not in the training set. So it, the data is from here, training data, but the robot is from here and it doesn't know what to do. So again, problem training test distributions are different. Now, then there's some awesome work. Um, uh, the algorithm is basically called data set aggregation or dagger. And it was specifically trying to address this problem. And the way it addressed this is by executing the policy itself during training. And what it did is it used this mixture policy. So all this language is, is fancy, meaning you flip a coin. With probability beta, you run the expert. With probability one minus beta, you run the learner. And then this is how the algorithm runs. You gather some expert trajectories. Let's say you know the robot's driving around this, uh, this racetrack. And you concatenate this with your previous data. Uh, you do imitation uh, behavioral cloning. So you learn to map inputs to output actions. And then you actually go back and you gather more data. But you don't actually gather it with the expert policy. You Again, you gather it with this nice mixture policy. So that's nice. That solves kind of the distribution issue. But now we run into a safety issue. So what's this issue? So Dagger, again, it mixes the policies with this coin flip policy. So how can this cause a catastrophic failure during training? Well, let's consider a scenario where we have, let's say, a flying robot. It's going to start here and it's trying to you know, fly and avoid crashing and use a cylinder. And let's say we have a, a fair coin, so beta equals 1 half. So let's say maybe it flips a coin and pi star says, OK, go left. And then maybe pi theta, which is maybe bad, says go right. Then pi star, you flip the coin, it says go left. And then all of a sudden, you've ended up crashing. And this is actually something that, that we ran into in our experiments. So here's a drone trying to navigate in this kind of infinite forest. And as you can see, it was running dagger. And then it just crashed with that cylinder right there. So what we developed is uh, this algorithm called uh, PLATO, so policy learning using adaptive trajectory optimization. And what PLATO does is that it actually mixes the objectives, um, the objectives being these things right here. So let's, let's explain these objectives in terms of, again, this example. So let's see what would happen. Again, same scenario. So we're executing this mixed objective policy, pi lambda, and we're going to see that the robot, maybe unsurprisingly, doesn't collide. And it's due to us mixing these objectives. So this term right here says, OK, I want my policy to be as similar to the learner as possible. So when it's far away, and well, and this term says, OK, I want to be like the expert. So when it's far away from the obstacle, kind of what it focuses on is being similar to the learner. But if the learner messes up and it starts getting close, it kind of automatically adjusts itself to care more about what the expert would do. And in this case, it'll avoid collision. OK, so now let, let's take a step back and look at the algorithms that we looked at. So we have behavioral cloning. It gathers data using the expert pi star. Because it's the expert, it's safe. But we had this distribution mis mismatch problem. We then have Dagger, which uses this mixture policy down here. And it's not safe because sometimes it executes this learner, which might fail. Um, but it does have similar training and test distributions. And then lastly, we have Plato, and because it's mixing, mixing the objectives, it gets kind of the best of both worlds. OK, so let's, let's jump to some results. So here we show the final neural network policies uh, at the end of running Plato. So using the onboard sensors, which are kind of these uh, distance range measurements, the robot was able to fly through uh, a canyon and a forest environment. But on one hand, kind of the success of the policy at the end wasn't really what this work was getting at. What it was getting at was safety during training. So let's, let's take a look at these plots. So x-axis is how much training time it's done, and y-axis up here is performance. So our method in black, as you can see, it's able to learn by the end, but also the other methods are able to learn by the end as well, no problem. But what we really care about is this graph, these graphs on the bottom. So the y-axis is how many times does the robot crash during training? And as you can see, our method in black is basically almost zero, while these other dagger variants, kind of the dashed lines, they do end up crashing, um, which is you know, mostly unacceptable, especially in the navigation sense. OK, so yeah, let's, let's jump to some takeaways. So I think the, the first key concept is that a lot of times we think about safety maybe only during evaluation, so it's, you know, only when we just finally want to run the robot. But it actually matters during training. You know, we can't be you know, destroying the robot or the environment while we're training um, in many scenarios. 
Uh, another one is that um, kind of implicit in this work is we needed a computational expert because we needed to know the expert's cost function. Um, and in some follow-up work that I did at Skydio, uh, we built kind of on this work and showed that this was actually a really powerful concept. Um, so I think this is something, something general that I learned. Uh, and lastly, I think the, the, the main challenge you know, that we all assumed was that experts kind of, we assumed an expert in order to learn, and, and that's a big assumption. Uh, in fact, we did this work back in 2016, and probably the main reason we switched to the other works that I, that I showed earlier was because you know, we just we ran into a fork in the road. Do we have, are we willing to implement an expert? And we decided that in our case, it, it wasn't, uh, it didn't make sense. But I think there are many cases in which it does, and in which case you should use the expert. OK, um, so let's see. We got 15 minutes left. So I guess in summary, um, yeah, I covered you know, work addressing sample efficiency, supervision, and safety. Um, this is a subset of the, of the work uh, I've done. Um, so I'll just briefly touch on some work that myself and collaborators have done. Um, so starting with sample efficiency, um, Anusha Nagabandi uh, kind of led some work on getting a roach to learn to this roach. It's a uh, cockroach-inspired robot uh, uh, to learn to navigate using model-based reinforcement learning. Um, and two undergrads that I worked with, Katie King and Sunil Belkale, uh, worked with these uh, quad rotors. In this work, it was trying to leverage simulation in order to learn faster in the real world. And in this work on the right, it was trying to use meta learning uh, in order to adapt to these different payloads that are attached to the quad rotor. Uh, in supervision, we had some work uh, here where we tried to actually use computer vision models to provide the supervision. Uh, in this work, I did at Skydio. Yeah, that's, that's me on the ATV. That was a lot of fun. Um, we tried to use the existing SAG Skydio autonomy engine in order to provide the supervision. And uh, lastly, this is uh, some work that I think Sergey alluded to, but I uh, didn't present here as, uh, you know, in the past few weeks, uh, getting our robots to actually navigate on the streets of Berkeley, uh, which many of you know are quite diverse. And then in the safety category, uh, we did some prior work. Uh, this work right here um, was more along the conservative of lines. Um, basically, if it, the model thought it was uncertain, it would fly slower. Uh, here we did some work which combined a framework of guided policy search with an MPC planner, which is kind of a safe planner. And uh, this was work led by uh, Tianhao. And here, our work by, led by Ron McAllister, we uh, did a project where we were dealing with what happens when we see something that we don't know. Let's say we've never seen a room like this. And the algorithm basically worked by saying, okay, what is the most similar of this to what I've seen in my training data? And this led us, the robot making intelligent decisions. Okay, so yeah, that, that's basically the end of the, I guess, the formal part of the talk. Um, but there's kind of two important things I, I wanted to cover at the very end. Um, so the first I want to cover is some, I guess, maybe more informal uh, lessons learned. Um, so by informal, uh, if, if you're a grad student, or you've been in academia, you're hopefully familiar with like a grad student. Um, and here's an example, uh, exercising on the treadmill, the grad student trains to feel exhausted while going nowhere. Um, so this dark humor is supposed to kind of get at kind of what is you know, a PhD actually like? Um, so by this, I mean, you know, why did I do a PhD? How did I survive it? Uh, what did I learn? Um, and, and the purpose I wanted, the reason why I wanted to talk about this is not meant to tell others you know, how or why they should do a PhD, um, but more, uh, I think some of these things might be insightful because they're things that are not really talked about uh, formally, but, but more informal. Uh, so the first thing is, why did I do a PhD? Um, I guess, yeah, maybe a bit more detailed, like if you stripped away everything else, like kind of what was the bare minimum that got me, that got me to do it? Um, I think on an intellectual level, I, I think I hopefully distilled this into, uh, into my PhD uh, dissertation title, uh, Mobile Robot Learning. Like I love to navigate, like I've always been into maps, getting from A to B, that's just something I've always been passionate about. Um, I've been passionate about robots because I really like the fact that they you know, exert change on the actual real world. And uh, I really like learning just for the notion of improving over time. Like I think someone, there's some quote that says, you know, the definition of insanity is doing the same thing twice and expecting a different outcome. Well, if our robot, you know, tries to open a door and messes up twice, like it shouldn't do the same thing, at least do something else. So that's kind of on an intellectual level, but on a personal level, I really liked the idea of doing something never done before. 
kind of trying to investigate and push the boundaries, I think it is what really drove me uh, at my core. Okay, uh, how did I survive my PhD? Um, so I think this has the implicit thing that it is challenging and I think there are a lot of challenges for, for those who are familiar. Um, you might have no progress for months at a, progress, uh, uh, a project that was for eight months, I was stuck on it, same thing. Um, you're surrounded by a bunch of awesome peers who you learn from, but it, this kind of implicit comparison of, you know, if you're stuck while someone else is making progress, it, it, it can make it challenging. Um, there's also working with your advisor and trying to, you know, align interests uh, can also be a challenge. Um, there's this notion of getting scooped. Um, basically, if you're working on something and someone publishes and beats you to the punch, uh, that can really uh, be, be super sad. Um, and maybe there's this general notion of, you know, I'm not good enough. Um, because you're just surrounded by a bunch of you know, smart, awesome people. Um, and there's a lot of challenges I haven't addressed that can be more specific to, to people. Um, but I think some things that have been useful for me um, to, to get through this are, one, I think I found a research niche, um, maybe accidentally, but kind of I, I drifted towards focusing on mobile robots and focusing really hard on the real world. And I think this gave me a lot of uh, breathing room um, in order to be able to kind of flesh out my work and not feel like I have to look over my shoulder um, constantly. Um, the second one was in, in the beginning of my PhD, I was definitely measuring my kind of success and progress by metrics like how many papers have I published and things like that. Um, and that kind of was getting depressing because I, I ran into a, a bunch of hurdles. Um, so I think I kind of switched my mindset to, you know, I told myself that if I'm you know, I'm succeeding if I'm learning and doing new things. And kind of this more process-oriented approach uh, was really good for, for myself and, and my motivation and happiness. Um, and lastly, uh, relying on colleagues, family, and friends, uh, you know, a, lot, a lot of you on the crowd, um, kind of this journey is not a solo one. It, it takes a group effort. Um, okay, and lastly, what I want to talk about is that what did I learn from my PhD? Um, I mean, obviously, there's the technical things that I, that I talked about for the first part. Um, but I think the main thing is kind of this notion of persistency. Um, maybe not, not in the stubborn sense of just, you know, try again and again until you succeed, but kind of in this notion of balancing uh, when to persist and, and when to pivot to a different approach. Um, and I think that this is something like extremely general that I think the PhD taught me very well. Um, and I'm gonna take this with me wherever I go. Okay. So yeah, that, that's it for lessons learned. And I just wanted to conclude with some, some acknowledgements. Like, like I said, this is a group effort. So I think, yeah, ev everyone should get credit. And I'm sorry in advance if I forgot anyone, it was unintentional. Okay, so first I want to start off with my collaborators. So these are all the people, um, plus, sorry if I forgot, um, who directly helped with a lot of the work that I showed um, and work that I didn't even show. So obviously my advisors and then a bunch of people uh, from Berkeley and beyond. So thank you. Uh, next, I want to thank my committee. So obviously my advisors, Sergey and Peter, uh, but also Ken and Claire. Um, they, uh, if you're not familiar, the committee kind of provides uh, guidance uh, throughout your PhD, and they've all been awesome in helping me uh, stay on course. Uh, I also want to specifically call out uh, both my advisors, um, and just there's a lot of awesome things uh, about them for the past uh, past five or eight years. Um, but I just want to say one thing about each of them. So uh, first for Sergey, um, I think one awesome thing about Sergey is that he really does inspire and keep the project alive. So a, a common thing that happened during my PhD is like you're working really hard on a project and there's a lot of failures. And the failures aren't actually the hard part. It, the scariest thing is when you run out of ideas and so you don't know, you have no idea what to do next. And, and Sergey was great in providing, you know, concrete technical ideas to, uh, you know, to, to, to keep the light alive, um, but also kind of the more like psychological, emotional part of, you know, being the optimist and saying like, hey, like, you know, we, you know, I believe in this, you should believe in this, let, let's keep pushing. Uh, and, and that was really awesome. Uh, for, for Peter, um, I guess, yeah, one awesome thing about Peter is he's extremely direct and has very good intentions. Um, so, Wait, I'll, I'll talk about a specific example that, that uh, I'm not sure Peter knows, but when I started off in the lab in my sophomore year of undergrad, I was working on this project trying to get a robot manipulator to move. And I'd been stuck for my first two weeks. And, and Peter came by and talked to me and I, I was you know, kind of 
scared of him at the time because like he was a big professor and I was like a nobody. Um, and I kind of told him and what was going on. He kind of said, he, he said, this is going to sound a bit harsh, but like, he's like, I expected, I think a high school student could do this. So like, I think you can do this. Um, and at the time, I think that was scary, but like, as I quickly got to know Peter, like that direct feedback, plus like he really had my good intentions in mind, I think it has been a very potent combo and has helped me all the way yeah, throughout my PhD. And, and you probably guessed at that point that he probably had worked with some pretty amazing high school students at some point too. <laughs> that too, I don't know if high school students <laughs> I, I think he meant something else by high school student than what you thought. <laughs> Perhaps. Uh, we can ask him after. Um, <laughs> um, yeah, so, so thank you. Um, yeah, and, and I want to uh, put a shout out to uh, yeah, all my lab mates from both RAIL and RLL. Um, I've learned a lot from all of you. Um, we've also had a lot of fun and honestly, like probably of the two or three most important things, like my, my colleagues have been the, the best part of my experience and that, that's really what made, what made this awesome. Um, I'm gonna go through some picture collages just, just for some memories. Um, so we had some fun in lab. Uh, here's a post ICRA deadline. This is a common robotics one. Um, and here's some photos of uh, me and Adam with our robot. Um, here's a picture of Adam with this thing that I accidentally caught him, caused him to get cut and he had to go get stitches. So robotics is hard, um, don't doubt it. Um, oh, so some people know this, but uh, I've had a pledge from the very beginning that, well, I know people were sleeping, so I started taking photos and said I'd make a collage for my thesis. So I'm, I'm holding up my end of the bargain. Um, so I think one takeaway from this that I really liked is like lab always felt like home. Um, obviously people are sleeping. Um, so, hey, maybe not in a good way, Greg. <laughs> no, this is a good way. I mean, come on, that shows how hard these people are working. You don't know what time of day it is. Well, in some of you. Um, so yeah, thank you lab mates. Uh, we also had some fun outside of lab, um, you know, boating, ATVs, some skiing, some ping pong. Um, and I think this balance uh, what was really, you know, helped, helped me a lot and, and it was a lot of fun. We also went to conferences. So this is, you know, the work I presented. The, the main presentation factor is these, uh, these posters. So you have people come up, they either love your work, maybe they hate it, why didn't you cite them, things like that. Um, but it's an awesome way to, to talk with people and, and kind of, meet the broader research community. Uh, and we also had fun and, and, and got to explore a lot of places. Luckily, robotics goes to exotic places from, I think, Australia to Singapore, Korea, Switzerland, Germany. Uh, and this kind of broadened my horizons a lot, which, which is, I think, good for my all around uh, self. Uh, I also want to thank my housemates. So I lived in a house that started off with five X PhDs um, and has since diversified. Um, and it, this was really an awesome place to, to come back to um, and, and live throughout, throughout my uh, PhD years. Uh, I also want to thank uh, these, uh, I guess, non-lab friends. These are my friends from, from my hometown, Burlingame. Um, I, we've known each other for a long time. Like This is 1998, I think. Um, but in the context of grad school, hanging with them has, has really made me a happier and more fulfilled person. Um, so, so thank you for that. And I also want to obviously thank my family. Um, I'm for sure missing, missing photos on this one, um, but, but they've been loving and supporting since age zero and beyond, and I really wouldn't be who I am or here without them, so, so thank you. And as my final slide, I wanted to uh, throw a shout out to three people in particular, uh, my mom and dad and my girlfriend, Olivia. Um, for my mom and dad, uh, they really supported me in every way possible, and they enabled me to, to pursue my passion. And this took a lot of hard work on their on their side. I mean, my dad was raised by a hardworking single mom, and you know, worked his way through college. My mom's parents were Holocaust survivors, and and worked really hard to give her awesome opportunities, which she in turn worked really hard as well. And then together, uh, growing up, you know, they owned a small business that really worked hard to provide for for my brother and I. Um, so, so I really am appreciative of that, and really do this again as as a shared achievement. I wouldn't be here without them. Uh, and for Olivia, um, during this whole process, I've leaned on her a lot. Um, she's been part advisor, listening to my ideas and giving her thoughts, um, part collaborator. She's helped me with like robot hardware stuff and lending her voice to, to my video narrations. And, and also, you know, part therapist, because like I said, you know, there's a lot of hard things during, during a PhD. 
Um, so again, uh, this, yeah, this PhD is, is a shared achievement. So yeah, that's it. Thank you 